Another episode of the Anxiety RX podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I have a very special guest, one of my favorite books, Body Aware, which I talked about a number of times. Her name is Erica Hornthal. She's a dance move psychotherapist, and she's just come out with these cards that I love where you can just mindfully read an exercise and get yourself into it. So without further ado, Erica, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you. Yeah, tell me about the cards. Like, uh, they're new. I, I, it's a great idea. Oh, thank you. Uh, they are brand new. They actually just yeah. released on Tuesday the 12th, which for our recording is yesterday. Okay. <laughs> um, um, but they were actually born out of a place of need within my own community. I live just a couple miles down the road from Highland Park, Illinois, which suffered mm. a major tragedy just a few years ago on July right. 4th. And as someone that offered crisis counseling just a day after the event occurred, and as a movement therapist, it was really evident to me just how much people were carrying in their bodies. And that, as you know, when we are disconnected from our body, we cannot really process anything. We're just right. so out of our body. We say we're in our minds, although I think we're completely out of our minds, too. We're just in Kind of, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the deck was born out of a need of just how to help people get back into their body so that they can start to process their trauma. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I um, I haven't told you this, but my um, second edition is coming out in September, hopefully. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I specifically talk about your book, Body Aware, in that I mention it specifically in the book. So it's like, uh, I really, I really love the book. I really do. I think it's, you know, there really is something about this dorsal vagal shutdown that we get into, right? When we go into anxiety, alarm, that loop that goes between the amygdala, the insula, the periaqueductal gray, names don't matter, but it's kind of like this loop that we get into and it paralyzes us. So one of the ways that we break the alarm anxiety cycle is with movement. But unfortunately, the way we're wired as human beings is when we get alarmed, we go into this freeze mode, right? So we don't want to move. And I've been in this situation so many times. I can't tell you how many times I've been in my bed, you know, especially like 10 years ago when I went through the height of my anxiety, like just unable to move, like I couldn't move at all. So just, and just yeah. getting up and just moving just feels like the, the hardest thing in the world. And I love Mel Robbins stuff too, like the five, four, three, two, one, go. Like I've used that a number of times too, but it just, it's just, when you get into that movement, you, you break the rhythm, you break the cycle, but it's so hard to kind of, you know, get going. Yeah. And you're not the first person to say that. I have, I have clients <laughs> that say that I get these comments on social media, right? Great not good for people in freeze. And that's where I actually try to interrupt that narrative because what I like right. people to understand is that we're always moving. So what yeah. is the movement that's happening in the freeze? Where are the stuck places? Where does it feel like I'm immobile? Because you're still breathing, your heart is still beating, mm. your eyes are probably still blinking. And for so many myself included, but so many of my clients, that is the inroad to movement. I love Mel Robbins' work as well. And I think what that does for us is that we can learn to use what movement is there to tap into motivation, which brings initiation, right? Or vice versa, right? Movement initiates, creates momentum. Therefore, that's, what, that's why that interrupting gets us out of bed. But we can get so stuck in that, how do I move? I'm frozen. Mm -hmm. So it's just meet your body where it is. What is the freeze? Can we tighten into the freeze? Can we stiffen the freeze? There's always movement happening. So I always say, what can you move? I can wiggle my toes. I can wiggle my fingers. That's all we mm -hmm. need. That's all we need is one inroad to more movement. And then we can expand from there. And before we know it, we might be exaggerating our breath. We might be accessing our lower limbs. Also remember that we are actively, more often than not, interrupting the pattern with our mind. So right. we're trying to use the mind to guide the movement when what we really need to be doing is using the body to guide the movement because the body intuitively knows what to do. Yeah, because the mind is going at 100 miles an hour. 
Right. We the body the isn't moving at all. <laughs> like there's just so much stuff going on in the mind. And I think that's, it's a trauma response for a lot of people. I think when we're younger, if you had trauma that was too much for you to bear, I think it does get stuffed down into your body. You go into this sort of free state that was reminiscent of the free state that you went into during your original trauma. And if you can, like I said, break that cycle, break that pattern. And when you talk about like people saying, oh, this isn't good for freeze. This is exactly good for freeze. This is exactly what you need to do. You need to move. And it reminds me of one of my old yoga teachers. She used to say that people would come up to her and say, you know, I'm, I'm not flexible enough for yoga. And she would say, saying you're not flexible enough to do yoga is like saying you're too hungry to eat. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So that's why you do it. Like, so, but I know that feeling. So it, is there... Is there like any tips or something other than the, uh, the cards, of course, that sort of gets people from that dorsal vagal frozen state where their mind is going a thousand miles an hour and just like, oh, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, just that cascade of anx anxious thoughts that actually allow you to kind of break out a dorsal vagal and and actually get into movement. Like, is there mm -hmm. like I know music is great for that. That's who I mean. You're a dance therapist. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. <laughs> I love me. We love music, right? Cause music, music is all about rhythm, you know, and, mm. and then rhythm inherently helps our body move, relax, uh, modulate, shift, change, et cetera. So, you know, if you have access to something like that, sometimes when we're in freeze, we can't reach over to the alarm clock or our phone to put on some music. Um, you know, as I always want to say, like, again, we want to meet ourselves where we are. And so for those of us who are already in sure. the mind, can we learn to cue the mind to start asking about the body in the moment? So if I'm really aware that I'm in freeze, what else can I be aware of? How is the freeze showing up? What is my body doing right now? And just notice that, right? We want to create awareness around how my body is contributing or perpetuating the freeze. Um, I use the acronym in body aware, ACE, awareness, challenge, express, or expand. Mm. So once we create awareness around how the body is showing up in this freeze, then I can challenge it. Well, my torso is really tight. So what can I move about my torso? Can I loosen it just a little bit? Can I shift the position of it? Because movement is just a shift in posture. Mm. And then what does that look like to expand? Can I breathe a little bit more? Can I... Maybe I'm in bed and all of a sudden I'm rolling over to the side. You know, one movement leads to another movement leads to another movement. So I think the problem is we have this definition of movement. You know, maybe movement is running outside and I'm in freeze. So I am not moving today. There's no way sure. that I'm running outside. Yeah. But if yeah. movement is just a shift or change in posture or position, I'm already doing it because my, right. again, my lungs are expanding. My heart is beating. My eyes are blinking. What else is there? We need to be curious about how to get myself moving in the way I want to be moving. So awareness, challenge or be curious, expansion or expression. That's, I say that's all it takes. That's a big thing when we're in shutdown. But oh, sure. It is yeah. possible. We don't have to just wait for it to lift. We can actively participate in the thawing process. And there is an, an inertia and momentum to movement. Like once you start moving... It's just, it's the old uh, inertia, you know, an object at rest tends to stay at rest and an object right, in, motion in motion tends to stay in motion. motion. Exactly. <laughs> so even what I, I will start people doing is the physiological side. You know, yeah, and Huber, Huberman talks about this a lot, like two quick sniffs in and then a long, slow exhale. Just often that just gets that premotor area of the brain kind of like, okay, okay, I'm okay. I'm open to that. I, I can still stay here and freeze and, and open up my breath. And then when you open your breath up a little more, there is this sort of space that gets created in your shoulders. And I say, you know, you really expand your chest when you do it, like feel your shoulders kind of move apart as you're breathing. Like just that change in posture thing, I think is so important because it is that inertia. Like you're really, because there is part of us that, that feels like we're behind a tree. There's a lion on the other side of the tree and we don't, we don't want to risk, you know, that three meter run to safety. We don't even want to take that. Right. Well, and, you know, whether it's processing trauma or regulating our nervous system, it has to begin with establishing a secure connection to the body. I don't even say safe because that's in the eye of the beholder. I don't know what right. safety is for you. That's a good point. I don't always know what safety is for me. But okay. establishing a secure connection back to the body is what's needed. And sometimes that is just stabilizing. It's 
propping my feet on the bed while I'm laying there. It's pressing my palms into the floor or into the desk in front of me. It's giving myself a hug just to feel the feedback of touch Mm. and to feel the pressure around my body. So we also need to be looking at sensations. How do I bring more sensation to the body so that I can start to feel again? And that feeling, right, that coming back to, well, we're already in those primitive parts of the brain, but signals, right, allows us to come back to that level of awareness, that level of cognition, and then maybe we can make those, in, those intentional moves of how to, how to get out, how to keep going. Um, but yeah, movement, momentum, initiation, or motivation. Mm. That's quite literally how we get going. We don't levitate. We don't just rise up. <laughs> we have to create some momentum, Um, And that doesn't come from the mind. It really has to come from a rhythm or a movement in the body. So when you're not in those shutdown places, that's a great time to ask yourself, what feels comforting to me? What brings more comfort to my body? What rhythms are comforting? Do I like a rock? Do I like Mm. a sigh or a sway? Do I like a tapping rhythm, a padding rhythm, a squeezing rhythm? Because these are the things that we're going to need in those moments when we're shutting down and actually need to reconnect to those nurturing sensations of comfort, not just survival. Right. And what about tapping like EFT and that kind of stuff? Do you ever use that with clients? You know, it's interesting. I use tapping all the time, but I don't mm. use it in that context of EFT. Like I'm, I'm not, mm. you know, I'm not trained in EFT. Um, I am trained in rhythms of the body. And I think tapping is just one of those. I mean, think about it when our, when a baby is born, we have either these kind of rubbing, soothing rhythms, Mm -hmm. or we have this padding, tapping rhythm. You know, this comes back to early patterns of movement in the body that are helping to regulate a nervous system or co-regulate a nervous system. Or I laugh sometimes like to dysregulate us because maybe it's the mom that really needs to calm down. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Just stop crying. So I, you know, it's not to discredit EFT, I just don't want to pretend that I'm, you know, this practitioner that's like, oh yeah, I'd use this all the time. I just use that idea of tapping as this inherent primitive, um, you know, early rhythm, right? That just feels right. good to some of us. Tapping isn't going to feel good for everyone. And I think that's a big thing to recognize that when, with something like EFT, I've had clients say, this doesn't feel good. There's something wrong. Yeah. I'm broken. Yeah. You know, same thing with EMDR, right? So we just have to remember it's not just the movement, it's the execution of the movement. And I'll ask clients, I'll say, well, how do, you know, tap on your heart for me, tap on your chest. Mm. How does that feel? Jarring. Now rub your heart for me, massage your heart. How does that feel? Oh, that's much better. So that's not to say that EFT isn't effective, but it's almost too jarring for their nervous system to even access. And so we have to start with those other rhythms that, feel more nurturing and supportive to our nervous system. Um, So we're just looking at kind of those primal, you know, indigenous to the body rhythms that we knew when we were birthed and that we've just gotten so far away from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it becomes a safety mechanism or, or at least a perceived safety mechanism for people who are in trauma when they're younger. And trauma doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, you're abused, abandoned, neglected, whatever. If you were born with a very sensitive nervous system, which just about everybody that I deal with with chronic anxiety was, you know, just even even things like tapping, even things like EMDR can really trigger people. You know, so I'm, I'm not, you know, my basis is, you know, anxiety comes from a separation of your adult self and your child self because the adult doesn't want to go back and visit the child because the child holds all their pain and the child doesn't want to visit the adult or, or uh, be acknowledged by the adult because it, it kind of wants to hide. And it, and it, it, it wants, but it, by the same token, it wants that connection, but it's afraid to have it for sure. And then there's the body, and then mind body disconnect. So to wrap that together, so it's an adult self, child self disconnection and a mind body disconnection. And to heal from it, you've got to pull your mind and body back together and you've got to pull your adult self and your child self back together. And movement is one of those ways, like when we were kids, we were moving all the time. Yeah. Yep. And the older we get, the further we are from it, the more we have to add it into our day to be healthy, to lose weight, right? All those narratives, et cetera. Um, 
I mean, look, even movement for kids looks different today. You know, Mm -hmm. there are less playgrounds available. There's less recess available. There's less improvisational movement accessed, you know, that's accessible to kids. I think more and more we're really prioritizing the cognitive piece um, when we need both. We really need both. Um, I'm a firm believer. I say this all the time that movement precedes cognition. You know, Mm -hmm. how we learn who we are and how to be in the world comes from the movements early on in our lives, like before the age of two. And then when we're able to cognitively cognitively process and have that higher executive functioning, we're like, thanks movement. You did what you needed. We're done. You know, and I'll just revisit you at the gym every now and then. (laughs) So the thing is like the body is the vessel is the catalyst to help support us through these things, help support us through life challenges to keep us moving, to keep us safe. And we, we kind of, we just leave it in the dust, right? We're like, okay, I'll come back to you when I need to. And now we have a society that's learning how to breathe again. We have a society that's learning how to move again, how to connect to ourselves. And when your trauma is embodied, which all is right. Body has everything. Body keeps the score. Bravery to come back to it. It is like revisiting the scene of the crime over and over again. So we have this dichotomy of like, go to the body. This is where your trauma will be healed. And then we have people saying, but that's where my trauma is. So totally. how do I revisit something to feel safe, right? Th- and that's so exactly what I work with people. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly yep. like, how I work with people. It's such an act of courage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, you know, the thing is, you know, I believe that, that that source of trauma is held in your body. You can find it if you look for it. Most people are so stuck in their heads. They don't even... They don't even look for the trauma in their body. You know, I say when you get upset, when you get anxious, when you get worried, you know, don't stay in your head because you're never going to find, you're not going to find peanut butter in a hardware store. Like go into your body, find it, like look, look for it in your body because that's where you'll find it. And that, that representation of alarm in your body, whether it be your throat, your heart, your solar plexus, your gut, whatever, that is a function of your younger self. That is a function of the child in you. And if you connect with that sensation and really dive into it and, and you know, does it have a color? Does it have a shape? Is it deep? Is it superficial? Is it hard or is it soft? Is it hot? Is it cold? Like all this stuff allows you to kind of access, access that younger version of you where the trauma is stored in the first place. So that's, that's my, that's kind of my therapeutic approach. And, and, you know, in my training with somatic experiencing and to some extent, internal family systems, which I haven't done a lot of training in, but SE I'm, I'm qualified in, but it is one of those things where we have to really understand that we don't operate solely from the mind. And I think in this dopamine driven, uh, accomplishment, uh, driven society, dopamine is just king and it just gets us into our cognition and gets us out of our feeling state. Mm. So speaking of dopamine, actually, I started a lot of my work early on working working specifically with older adults, many of mm-hmm. whom had Parkinson's, which we know right. is not specific to only older adults, right. but it's a dopamine um, deficiency in a sense, right? And yep. so what I found so interesting is that when we moved it didn't increase the dopamine, but it increases the efficacy of the dopamine mm-hmm. that we have at our disposal, right. which right. I think is one of the reasons that it makes movement in whatever capacity for movement disorders so important. And it's not just a rehab. It's not just a physical therapy. Right. It's like improvisational, creative movement. And just going back to what you said, you know, it's this narrative of, okay, well, go back into the body. And then we look, we're like trying to figure out, okay, where, where, how, you know, so many of us think of the body as the problem. The body is not the problem. It is the answer. It is the answer like that. It's, it's, that's where everything's housed. Right. So we're like, I'm not doing it right. I'm not moving correctly. How you move and what you need is going to be independent for everybody, right? Like I can't assume what it's like to be in your body. You can't assume what it's like to be in mine. And so it's really difficult because now we have this emerging narrative, which I'm so glad it's there, but we have this emerging narrative of somatics Mm -hmm. and body-centered interventions. And I think people are still asking how, how should it look? What should I do? Only you can answer that for yourselves. That's where the answer lies, right? That's where you getting out of freeze is. And it's hard because it takes time and practice to access that. But I promise you that it is worth the work. 
It is worth the time that you put in because it will change your relationship to anxiety forever. Yeah, we're such a thought-driven society, you know, and as we get older, we lose a lot of that movement. You know, it just it just naturally occurs. We get busier and busier and busier and and movement kind of gets pushed away farther and farther and farther. So we we sort of worship the mind in the society and we get away from the body and we get away from this this sort of grounded state. And one of the things I'll say all the time is that your mind will lie to you constantly, but your oh, yeah. body never can. It can't. Right. Right. Martha Graham said the body never lies. You know, right. it's this barometer kind of telling the soul, the weather pattern, right? Um, it's true. We do, look, you know, and sometimes the mind has the best of intentions, but I, I like to say that oftentimes our mind gaslights our body, you know, and we're having all these conversations about what it's like to be gaslit, you know, consider what that means for your own mind body connection. You know, are you gaslighting your own body's needs and how do we just get more in touch with that? How do we learn to relinquish the mind, which as you were talking also makes me think of self. How many of us okay. identify the self in the mind, you know, and that if yes. I'm out of my mind, I lose touch with myself, but right. the self is housed in the body, right? Which includes brain, but not everybody feels their mind is in the body. Sometimes it feels like it's external. Sometimes it feels it's kind of like mm -hmm. floating outside of our head. There's no one piece in our brain that is the mind specifically. And so I think that's a good reminder is like, if we want to get back to self, right? Mate talks about trauma being a split of the self, right? the fastest way into the self is through movement and body where the self is housed. But as we get older, we're so far from our authentic self and so much closer to what we think we should be, what we're told we should be, how we should act, how we should behave. We don't even know what it feels like to be ourselves anymore. So yeah. how would I access that, you know, through the mind? Because that's where myself is. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, one of the things I write about in the book is, like I said, if you were just a brain, you know, and you were being fed cerebral, you know, cerebrospinal fluid and, and oxygen and glucose through some blood, you know, things that you've made, would you feel anything? Because I've been in neurosurgery, I've assisted in neurosurgery before, where we cut right into the brain. The brain has no pain fibers in and of itself. Right. Right. We can get, yeah. we have to anesthetize the scalp and the skull. But other than that, <clears throat> the brain has no pain fibers, which is very ironic. So it's like, it's, it's the body that basically allows us to feel, but we lose that. And, and I think when we get traumatized as children, we go up into our heads because it's a form of dissociation, right? So we dissociate from our bodies into our minds because it works for the child. Like it, that, that, keeping yourself busy, worrying, hypervigilant mind, it does take you away from that trauma, that emotion that's still stored in your body. So to go yeah. back to it is there's a lot of resistance to that. And I think when you throw in dorsal vagal freeze to that, this is the reason why we don't move is because we don't, we feel like we're behind that tree and there's a lion on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, movement is like, it's kind of a certain way, right? I've got to run, but I can't. I have to freeze, but I want to run, you know, it's like what we think we should be doing. Um, you know, I resonate so deeply with what you were saying, because as a kid, even as an adult, but as an, as a kid, I escaped into my mind, even as a mm. dancer, I escaped into my mind. And that's for me, what felt like I could control. I can control the narrative. I can expect, I can anticipate what's going to come that I couldn't find that in my body. My body was just feeling the anxiety right. and that was really uncomfortable. Either I feel sick because of it or jittery, just unsettled to say the least. And so escaping into my mind didn't come with sensation. It just came with a sense of control. And it took right. me a long time, even as a dancer, <laughs> sometimes overriding what my body needed, to yep. come back to my body and realize, no, 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 this is a sign. This is that signal of alarm, right, that you talk about. That's telling me exactly where I need to be, exactly what I should be addressing. You talk about this all the time of like meeting that anxiety where it is. Place your hand on it. Move with it. It's not about solving it. It's not taking it away. We actually have to lean into the emotion to let go. And right. we, we, we make ourselves smaller and smaller. I, I use that example or like metaphor of, um, of like a house, right? So if I have 6,000 square feet at my disposal, why am I only using right. 1,500 of it from the neck up? You know, like I want to be able to use the kitchen, the dining room, the basement. <laughs> I don't want to just confine myself to the bathroom. 
but that's what we do with our movement. We just, we com- we just constrict, we confine. That's what happens obviously when we're in fear states and anxious states. And so the best way to literally move through that emotion is to access more of my body, more of my movement. And again, it's micro movements. Start wiggling parts of your body that you are unaware of, right? The parts that don't house your anxiety because as crippling as it may feel, your anxiety is not everywhere, right? It overcomes the body, but it's not everywhere. So that's what I start. I've had clients in my office completely dissociated, and yet still sure. able to move through that state within a session um, just by how we pay attention to and organically in small ways access the body to help emote, right? To help express what we're holding on to. Well, it changes the pattern, I think. I think there is a pattern that we get locked into specifically with anxiety where I I think, like I said earlier, periacroductal gray, amygdala, insula, you know, the insula has a tremendous amount to do with how the body perceives. So I think my little theory is that when we get traumatized as children, the insula kind of creates this emotional signature of the trauma. So our body feels now the exact same way it did when we're eight years old and our mom was drunk or our dad was hitting us. Or, you know, we were getting bullied at school. We feel the same way. So yeah. if we can go in there and we can disrupt that program, we can start to change it. But if we don't ever touch that program, if we just sit in cognitive therapy going, yeah, that was terrible. You got bullied. You know, I feel bad for you, whatever it is. That doesn't change that underlying unconscious root of that program. It just basically makes you feel a little better about, a bit better about it cognitively. It doesn't change. And that's why I, you know, I have this sort of issue with cognitive therapy and that it works in the short term, but it's using the cognitive parts of your brain to try and fix you when basically when you get into alarm and survival, those parts of the brain are the first ones to get shut off. So CBT and a lot of cognitive therapies will leave you when you need them the most. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, now what? <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't have access to that. So how do I reframe? How do I access mindfulness? What do I do? <laughs> um, you know, thank you for bringing all that up and to, to speak to not only cognitively going back to those places, but a big piece of the narrative that I believe is missing from that mainstream conversation is that we revert back to earlier movement patterns. Sure. So you, and one of the best ways to notice this is in other people. So are you ever in someone's presence who, you know, is an adult, but is all of a sudden acting like a teenager, or you get the sense that I'm feeling like the parent in this relationship and you're my parent, right? Not only is that a cognitive thing that's happening in them, but notice their movement patterns. Their movements become a lot more adolescent or infantile, right? Right. And that's a big piece of interrupting that pattern too, is that oftentimes we're looking at interrupting the thought patterns. We don't even know that movement patterns are changing. And that's what happens in trauma, right? Not only are we brought back to or stunted in that cognitive development, but our movement development too. So, so many of my clients that come in, whether or not they identify with trauma, it will come out pretty quickly that there has been some some type of trauma. It's written on their body. They come in and I have to remind myself sometimes, I was working with someone a while back who um, was recovering from disordered eating. And I remember when she was thinking about going back into treatment and she said, you know, if what are some of the places you might recommend? And I start naming off places and she's like, well, those are, those are all adolescent facilities. I'm 35. I can't, I can't go there. And it kind of brought me back from it. And I was like, oh my God, right. Because the energy and the movement given off in our sessions are that of an adolescent. And I really had to remind myself that she's not, (laughs) like I knew she wasn't. So these are, these are valid points. And not just when we're in those free states, but this is why movement is so necessary in all forms of psychotherapy, because we have to be able to repattern those developmental movement habits so that we're not continuously um, looping them back in. You know, so even all the CBT that you've done, you know, you're training those thought patterns. Again, movement precedes thought in many ways. Are we combating those movement behaviors? Because oftentimes we're not. And then we're wondering, why am I still fawning? Why am I still trying to please this person? My mind knows I shouldn't, 
your body hasn't repatterned it. Yeah, when you say movement precedes thought, like emotion precedes thought too. Yes. And I think so, we're yes. so we're so driven by the mind. We so worship the mind that we think, oh, I had this sad feeling about uh, my daughter or whatever, and then my body got really upset. I would say, look, go back 90 seconds. I'll bet you your body was an alarm before your mind came up with a thought. Like there is this process called interoception where yep. the mind is constantly reading the body. And if we have this, what I call background alarm in my book, this old trauma that's stored in your body, your mind reads that through interoception. And it's not going to make up stories about cookies, puppies, and picnics. It's going to make up stories that are terrible, that are scary, because the mind is a, a fundamental me meaning making, make sense machine. So if there is this milieu, this feeling in our body of fear, your mind, even though you're not aware of it, will start making up fearful stories, which is basically essentially worry. So it's really understanding, like, can we get to the prodrome? Can we get to the, 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 the feeling before the feeling? Like if I can if I can access the alarm sensation in your body first before you start thinking before you start getting into that that loop of thoughts, then we can actually do something about it. But if once you're in the loop of thoughts, there's very little I can do to break that cycle other than moving back into the body. And if people are really resistant to going back into their childhood, going back into that alarm, going back into their body in the first place, it becomes a very difficult task to start healing anxiety. Right, right. Again, it's that cognitive piece where we're like, tell me about this. Talk yeah. about this. You know, that is just such a small percentage of our communication, 10, 15 percent, right? Tone and the actual language. Why are we not focusing on where that 85 percent of communication is housed? But as clinicians, doctors, therapists, we're not trained in that. I mean, nope. I am, but most people are not yeah. in that. And so it's really scary for the therapist. And so we're just going to rely on that cognitive, like, tell me what it was like when you were eight. Talk about that yeah. story. I always tell my clients the first time I meet them, I don't need to know your story. I don't need to hear the story unless you want to tell it. Right. Your body will tell the story for you. And sometimes in the most unopportune times, you know, hey, sure. we were just talking about what I had for lunch and all of a sudden, you know... I'm back in eighth grade in the lunchroom and frozen, you know, what's totally. going on here? It's just, we never really know. We tap into that and then create awareness around those experiences. So it's, yeah, I just, I see that the, the hardship, right. Is like psychotherapy really wants to go to this place of relying on, more on the body and somatics. And that almost goes against so much of what we've, come to believe as evidence-based, even though all of the evidence is there. You know, there's, well, there's, there's yeah. qualitative and quantitative research happening in our bodies, but it's really hard to explain. It's hard to research all of that. It's hard to sell it to insurance, you know? And right. so we still really want to hold on to that cognitive piece. And yet psychotherapy yeah. was born out of mind, body, spirit. You know, it's the integration of the three. And I guess, you know, kind of after dualism and all that good stuff, it's just so separate. We're starting to come back yeah. to it. We're looking at wholeness, but it is right. it is an uphill battle for a lot of us. Well, the thing about spirit is it's, it's, not, it's not reducible. It's not evidence-based. Like, you know, right. so much of healing from emotional trauma is, involves the, like our spirit inside of us. Like I know the mind pretty well. I know the body as a physician pretty well. But that spirit part, I mean – a lot of the, the theories will come out and say, you know, it's not so important the, the particular modality of therapy that you use. It's the relationship that you have with the person. That's what basically heals you. You know, and I see people go on these retreats and they come back and they go, oh, you know, I feel like a million dollars. It was amazing. They taught me all these things. And it's like, well, you know, it's not so much the things that they taught you there. It's the fact that you were around 20 people. You were all, in, you were all integrated. You were all, you all felt great with each other. That's right. what was healing about it. Right. And then about two or three weeks later, they kind of sink back into the old kind of pattern again. And the other thing about, you know, psychology, the way they're trained is, you know, to get funding, you have to be evidence-based and to be evidence-based, right. you have to be cognitive and to be cognitive, you lose that spirit part, you know, of that, you know, if when, the way I look at the brain and, you know, the amygdala, insula, periaqueductal gray, anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate, all, none of these structures understand language. None of them do. Right. And yet 
Most of them house a lot of trauma. So why are we using a language-based program and, and continuing to produce therapist after therapist after therapist who talks to a trauma that doesn't understand language? Right, right. I mean, This yeah, is where I get just, a little excited. No, me too. Me too. And yeah. I can tell. And I'm really loving this. And, yeah. and I talk about this a lot with other therapists. I just did a training on it the other day. I'm really pushing this kind of idea of, therapy beyond words, you know, right. and it's always met with after the fact or kind of like during the presentation, it's always meant with met with curiosity and like, oh, that does make sense. But, but there's still that disconnect, right? Of like, oh, that's interesting for some people, you know, or we, we kind yeah. of leave the clinicians feeling a little high and dry or like they need an additional certification. I've been joking, but like, you don't need to buy the letters B O D Y at the end of your name. Right. They come right. with your existence. You just have to learn how to tap into it. It's not always something you have to try on. It's just something that we have to learn to be with and to be present to. But because so much trauma is embodied, that is that is the that is so much easier said than done. And so yeah, that nonverbal piece is so important. And yet most of us all of us, I would imagine listening, have spent more time verbal than we have nonverbal. And well, so, we speak to ourselves you know, in words. We speak to other people in right, words. We speak right. to ourselves in words. So we get to, we, we sort of, since we're two years old, we get very familiar with words as a way of communicating. So we sort or we of- even tell our you know, kids, use your words, use your exactly, words. Exactly, exactly. tell me. <laughs> and and I'm not against in in no way am I against cognition, but I think that there's there's this huge bias, especially in universities. Again, because it can be uh, reproduced. It can, that's how you get funding is to you know you give somebody a, a like an anxiety questionnaire, they do twelve weeks of CBT, and then the, their score drops. Of course it does. But a year right. later, all that CBT is gone because their ego has pulled them back into the same old programs through their amygdala, through their insula, through all these programs. It pulls them back into that same old place that they were before. So that's why I get a little uh, frustrated. Like I have no problem with CBT at all, but it's mm -hmm. not going to heal you. It'll help you cope, absolutely, but it won't mm -hmm. heal you unless you start introducing, and this is why I get so uh, worked up about this, is because unless you start introducing this somatic experience and you start acclimatizing. Bessel van der Kolk talks about this in The Body Keeps the Score. He says, you know, we're not teaching people how to get rid of their anxiety. We're teaching you essentially how to acclimatize to this sense of alarm. He doesn't use the term, but that's what I use. The sense right. of alarm that's in their body so that they can go into it. They can, they can kind of embrace it. They can hold on to it, even though it hurts. Because then they don't have to compulsively escape into their head all the time. If you can handle the pain that's in your body, you don't have to escape into your head to start explaining it. Right. And you know what? You can't intellectualize trauma. And that's what we've right. gotten really good at doing. And yeah. and um, the experts are meant to in intellectualize it, right? Like that's why they write about it and we read about right. it and we, we watch them present on it. And it makes sense when we're not traumatized. But when we are traumatized and our body is in those fight, flight, freeze or fawn patterns, we can't intellectualize our way out of the experience. You know, I say this all the time. We have to but we try our way in to think yeah. our way out. Right. We try. Right. We try so yeah. hard. <laughs> oh, I'll just try this time. Oh, I'll think this thought. No, no, no. You have to quite literally feel your way in to think your way out. That's how you let go of, of emotions. You don't let them yeah. go. You let them in. No. Yeah. And that reminds me of the sirens, you know, the story of, um, uh, Ulysses and the Sirens, where they would sail past Siren Island and they, there was these creatures of indescribable beauty and they would sing and they had this beautiful singing voice and the, the sailors would steer their ships into the rocks and then the, the beautiful women would turn into horrible monsters and kill them. So it's basically, you know, it, the sirens are your thoughts and the sirens are kind of beckoning to you like, hey, we have the answer. We have the answer over here. All you have to do is think more. Just think more. Just think more. <laughs> and as, as children, we buy into that because it does give us the illusion that it does work because it does dissociate. It does distract us from this pain in the body. But unless we actually go into that pain and start swimming around in it, even though it hurts, we never acclimatize to it. We never actually learn. And the, the little analogy that I got this morning, like when I wake up, I always get these little downloads in the morning when I first wake up was like, if you were trying to make some toast 
and you could only press the toaster, it would only last for three seconds. You're never going to make toast like that. Every It's going to go for three <laughs> seconds. It's going to heat up. It's going to warm up the element and then it's going to shut off. That's exactly what it's like to go into your head with your thoughts and then expect this trauma that's stored in your body to actually get processed, to actually get toasted. It never will because you never spend enough time in it to actually make any headway with it. Right. It's funny. I use, I use the metaphor. Of, well, a lot of people do the tools, right? Our toolbox. Right. And I remember working with a client once and we, we talked a little bit about that. We were like, what does this mean? What's a toolbox? So, you know, we kind of settled on the idea that it's like you're walking around with a hammer, a hammer, a hammer, a hammer. And then you walk in front of a door that's locked and you're trying to open the locked door with the hammer. Not going to get too far. <laughs> And, and you can kind of, well, you can bludgeon it, pick yeah. up the locks. right. I mean, you could like hammer the door down, but the idea isn't to find a way to make that tool work for you. The idea is to build more tools. And mm. for me, that is movement. It's not building on, it's not creating more movement. It's expanding the repertoire that is already within us. So right. if you're only moving a certain way, that's your hammer. That's all you'll ever have in your, in your toolbox. You want right. to expand your range of emotion not just your range of motion your range of mm. emotion through the body that's what Ooh, builds like resilience that. that what that's what builds the titration right that we hear about right. in trauma circles that's what builds that embodied sense of centered and groundedness and that can be how far i can reach my arms out i remember working with my very first client who came from a lot of background of trauma Physically, she was completely able-bodied. And I remember when sitting across from her, asking her to do some simple movement assessments, she could barely extend her arms beyond her shoulders. And then mm. year, you know, months, weeks, months, a year goes by. Her moan, her, her sorry, range of emotion had changed so much that asking her to do those same assessments, her arms reached to both walls of her apartment, mm. which is where we were doing our sessions. So you know, no amount of physical therapy or gym going is necessarily going to give you that. But right. looking at how to develop these movement patterns, how to expand your own movement repertoire, I call it, or vocabulary, that's where the resilience lies. That's how we move right. through these traumatic experiences. Because again, they keep us small. They keep us in certain movement patterns because that is the safety. That is, like you said, hiding behind the tree. And right. stepping out from the tree is too traumatizing or re-traumatizing. So how do we slowly emerge? That's building a better movement vocabulary. Yeah. And I remember reading your book and I remember, I remember doing yoga that afternoon and going, this is so much more enjoyable. And I've told you this oh, I before. You told it's, me it's, that. it's like, I was, I was actually, I was actually feeling, you know, my shoulder feeling the, the humerus as it rotated in the, in the, in the, uh, in the glenoid. And it, it was just like, it was like a brand new world, you know? And I had, and I, I still have a very soft spot in my heart for you because that, that book really, you know, I've read a lot of books and it was just like that really turned on a light for me because now, whenever I practice now, I can't not do it. You know, I mean, I will do some sort of unconscious when I like, okay, I got to do yoga. I'm still half asleep. Okay. I'll downward dog, whatever. But, sure. you know, it really does. It really changed the way that I, I, cause I, before we get into the asana, we get into the pose and it's like, it's such a, a body memory, the pose. I don't even think of going outside of that because it's so automatic, you know? And then it's so, so again, the reason I said that it's kind of making the conscious, the unconscious more conscious so that it's like movement now becomes this conscious thing. And I think that's how we actually start repatterning. We can continue to do the asanas. You can do yoga till the cows come home. If you do those sort of, you know, almost like hot yoga, the 26 poses in the same order every time, you know, but if, if you start introducing some sense of conscious exposure to, okay, how is my shoulder moving? How is my back moving? And really getting, it's not just, and, and that's, that's even a cognitive question. It's like you get into this state where it's <laughs> right. like you actually feel how it's moving and you can't really describe it in words because it's not really describable. You're actually getting into the isness, the ipsaity of the movement. Yes. Yes. Thank you for saying that so much because it's so easy for us to intellectualize, you know, we're like yeah. talking about it, thinking about it, but it's beyond thought or speech. It's just doing it. You have to experience it, which means you also have to have a safe container for it. You know, a space where you feel like you can explore these things. And for home, 
that's not for everybody. That's where the trauma mm. is or the stressors are. We don't have a therapist or a clinician that we trust. So that doesn't feel appropriate. Um, we want to get back to nature, but we don't live close to it or we right. have to travel for it. You know, it's like, where is the safe space? And in many ways it is inside of you, but even that takes time to rebuild if that hasn't felt like a safe space. So, right. you know, just, I do it as a dancer. I can, I can dance on autopilot till, like you said, the cows come home, right. yeah. but to dance mindfully and to bring what is the unconscious mind to conscious awareness through improvisation, through, you know, random movement parties, if you will, a dance party in my house, like just moving for the sake of moving is very different than moving to set a goal or to meet an intention. Mm. Um, I have my clients do this where we move from our minds and then we move from our bodies. How's that look? From your mind would be, I don't move until my mind tells me to raise my arm. I raise my arm, blink my eyes. I blink my eyes. It's, it's, it's a little tedious because then you realize how much movement you actually do without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that for a minute or two until it feels maybe sometimes unbearable or like we've, okay, I got the point. And then I will just ask them to move for the sake of movement. You'll think you'll still be thinking, you'll still have thoughts, but it's not what's directing your movement. And I have to say the freedom, the fluidity, sometimes the relaxation that comes from just having permission to move as my body wants to move is so mind blowing for people. You Mm. know, then we talk about, was that hard? What were the difficulties? What were the challenges? What was easier than you thought it might be? But because we constantly move from this place of mind um, when we engage in movement, right? Like exercise. Well, my doctor told me this, so I'm going to do that. Um, Not to throw physical therapy under the bus, but like it's, we're integrating, we're, we're, um, we're using the movement in a certain way, you know, a certain amount of time, certain intensity, just move for the sake of moving, you know, just give yourself the capacity to just move without thinking about it. You start to access movements that you didn't even realize were possible. And this is what makes it so adaptable. You know, it's, it's not about being a certain, you know, body type, right? It's not about being a certain gender or a certain, you know, neuro, um, uh, neurotypical development. It's like movements mm-hmm. for everybody. That is like the right. great diversifier because we all have different movement capacities. So just yeah. explore it, try it. You're already doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I often tell people like, you got to get out of your head. Right. And it's <laughs> right. uncomfortable. It's that's uncomfortable <laughs> for people because they've been spending decades in their head because that's been their dissociative I have this little uh, acronym I call MADD, which is like used to be Mothers Against Drug Drivers, but I medications, addictions, uh, distractions, and dissociation. That's basically mm-hmm. what happens to us, right? So one of the things that that movement and conscious movement brings us back into is this place like, oh, okay. And my big thing is it's going to hurt. The alarm in your system is going to hurt. There's no way around it. So you need somebody, maybe a therapist, maybe someone, maybe your partner, whatever, someone who can support you in that movement towards going what to what hurts. And just, right. you know, you don't have to sit in like, there's a lot of stuff out there now on, on a good room. Like you have to sit in your pain and let it metabolize and stuff like that. On some level, yeah, you do, but you don't have to sit in there for like five, 10, 15 minutes. You don't have to be in agony. You can, you can be in that pain for 30 seconds and then go into a place that maybe feels better? Is there a movement that makes you feel safer? Is there, you know, raising your hands above your head, putting your hands on your chest, tapping, whatever it is, is there this movement that allows you to kind of go into that trauma and go to the, because what you said earlier is like when we feel traumatized, when we go back into the old trauma, it feels like all of us, because when we were a child, it was all of us. There was no way out. But now that you're an adult, there is a way out. And I'll tell you what the way not the way out is, is is dorsal vagal shutdown. It's like freezing. (laughs) Like that's not the way out. But the other, like when you're faced with freeze or you're faced with going into your, your old pain, your old alarm, a lot of people will pick freeze because we will do anything not to go revisit that child and their pain. Right. Well, to speak to what you're talking about, it's like, it's pain either way. You know, I know, it's like, choose it's, your pain. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Pick you your know. pain. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. right. It's like, oh, going into my body is going to be really painful. It's going to be really uncomfortable. But I'm guessing that you're here because you're still experiencing pain, right? 
you're still right. suffering in a sense. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening. You wouldn't be thinking about it. You wouldn't be dealing with your anxiety in the way that you are or aren't, right? And so I just I always consider people or ask people to kind of consider that, right? You say that going into the body would cause more harm or pain or suffering. Are you not suffering already? You know, and so yep. not that we want to minimize that, but actively bringing in um, awareness, right, to something, even if it's uncomfortable or, or painful in a sense, in yep. the short term can create such long term gains that you could actually, in a sense, be, quote, pain free, right? Like not without pain, not without the experience right. of negative emotions completely, but you can learn how to move through that emotional pain yeah. instead of getting stuck in it. And that's beyond exercise, right? It's beyond a certain way to move. It's learning how to access and execute movement from within, bringing it out, expressing yourself, all of yourself, right? Because yeah. it's there. We've just, yeah. we've, you know, um, muffled it, stifled it, numbed it, minimized it, ignored it, all those good things. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of cold plunges because I've been kind of getting into those a little bit lately. And oh, yeah. when you first go into the cold water, it's like, oh my God, this is excruciating. This is horrible. <laughs> right? This is really painful, oh. right? Yeah. You like and then there's this, and then after you're in there about 15 seconds, there is this like, oh, okay. All right. No, I can. And then it's like, oh my God, this hurts again. This hurts again. This is terrible. This <laughs> yeah. is terrible. Get out, get out, get out. Oh no. Okay. All right. So there is this, I think there's this natural painkiller that we have in our brains, endogen, uh, endorphins and kephalins in the periaqueductal gray that get secreted when we're in pain. So the, we will get supported if we go into this trauma. We don't have to make it all of us, but we do need help often. Like some of the physical, emotional, sexual abuse things, like you need help. You can't, you can't process this on your own. Like this need, you need help. But in general, one of the things that I, I appreciate about cold plunges is that when I was a child and my dad was going crazy, I had no way out of that. But in cold plunges, I'm actually putting myself in the pain. And I think there is something that builds a, a resilience and capacity in your nervous system when you say, I know this is going to hurt me, but I'm going to do it and I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to stay with it. Now, this is not to say that you have to stay in your pain for you know hours at a time. You can come out. You can find a place in your body that actually feels comfortable or neutral or safe and then go back and forth. Pendulate is what they call it in, in somatic yeah. experiencing. And then you start you start processing this pain. But movement is just one of those things that's just a non-negotiable. Like I don't see anybody healing from anxiety who doesn't develop some kind of movement uh, ritual, you know? Right, so right. when speaking to the pain factor, I, I, in my mind, I keep the word discomfort keeps coming up, you know, or sometimes mm. it's unfamiliar, you know? So right. um, whether people listening are actually identifying as this as pain or it's just discomfort, which is not to minimize discomfort because right. that can be excruciating too. But I think that's where movement can really help because we can also sit in uncomfortable positions. I've been sitting this, mm. with this a lot lately is um, right. how often do we compromise our body? You know, like we sit in awkward positions. I was sitting in a position pretty regularly at my desk and for probably other reasons, like ended up developing sciatica, you know, but it felt wow, okay. it was familiar. I was like, but it's comfortable. Yep. It's familiar. Yep. And so consciously sitting in an uncomfortable position doesn't pain. It doesn't hurt. It's just really hard to stay in a position that's better for my body, but so unconditioned. So mm -hmm. I, I just, I just wanted to bring that up too, is we are lacking the ability to sit in discomfort, you know, as, as a yeah. society, we just, we want what we want when we want it. Instant gratification has led us to think that everything is a crisis if we don't get it right away. Yep. And we're uncomfortable. And there's ways to just titrate discomfort in your body, sit in a compromising position, cross your arms or legs the opposite way, brush your teeth mm. with the, you know, your non-dominant hand. Yep. These are uncomfortable, unfamiliar movements. And the more you do them, the more adapted your body gets to being in what feels like a, an uncomfortable um, yeah. situation, if you will, right? Uncomfortable movement. And, and that creates more room for that pendulation, right? Creates more, more room to build that window of tolerance. Like movement, it doesn't, 
it doesn't get you back into your window of tolerance. It expands it. <laughs> like right. we don't just want to get back into the bubble. We want to actually widen it. And when you increase your movement repertoire, that's what you're doing. Yeah. I haven't told anybody this, but basically what I do every day when I get out of the shower is I dry myself in a different way. That's my oh, little, that's my little brilliant. sort of, every, yeah. Sometimes I'll start with the side of my leg. Sometimes I'll start with my head. Like I just make this conscious, conscious idea. I'm going to dry myself in a different way each time. So it's a little bit of Dr. Russ there. I do it there. with driving. I drive a different yeah. way. I mean, I can, yeah. you know, like I live in an area where like you can take a million different routes to get to the okay. same place. Um, my kids will be like, where are you going? Why are we going this yeah. way? My little backseat yeah. drivers. I'm like, cause we can, because it's yeah. unexpected and it, it takes the same amount of time or it takes a few extra minutes, but it keeps me on my toes. It keeps me aware and alert and it's building dur- different neural pathways, just simply mm-hmm. moving in different ways. Yeah. So what tips would you give Erica, my, my audience who mostly deal with anxiety? Like what, what are the tips that you would, as a, as a movement therapist, like what are the things that people can access? Well, you know, it's cliche, as I said earlier, like that awareness, but we're so eager to avoid it that Mm. the best thing we can do is actually pay attention to it. So notice where you feel your anxiety. I know that for your audience, this is nothing new. No, but that's it, true. It's it's worth hearing again, over and over again. You know, it's it's not necessarily even though we're I started talking about this card deck. It's not about trying anything on. It's just meeting it where it is. What's mm. the rhythm? What's the intensity? How are you already moving? And and meet yourself there. You know, so often mm. that's that pain point. We're like, well, I don't want to go into the pain. It's going to hurt more. But the thing is, when you validate it, you acknowledge it, and you witness it, it goes away because right. it feels like it's been heard. Right. Like you see me, that's that inner child wounding. We weren't totally, we weren't heard. Our needs were minimized or ignored. You're going into your inner child and you're saying, I feel your pain. I see that you're anxious. Let me hold you. Let me meet you in that. And so that could be, you know, the tapping rhythm that can be that rocking, you know, maybe it's a sensation and you just, you, you recognize the sensation, go into it again. I can't say this enough that if you want to work through or let go let go of an emotion, you have to go into it first. It doesn't mean it has to be excruciating. It doesn't have to be any more than what you're already experiencing, which is already debilitating for so many of us. So just listen to it. What, how is that showing up for you? And you can tell you five seconds. Okay. I've got to, okay. I can't do that anymore. Right. Meet it again. Take a break. Meet it again. Take a break. The other thing that I like to do also is like when we're feeling anxious, as an example, we're also feeling unsupported. And so I tell my mm. clients, um, find the nearest place of support. Like I use a wall and either push your hands into that wall or press your back up against that wall. Like feel the pressure, feel the support externally. It will signal that internal support, oftentimes lowering those cortisol levels, regulating our heartbeat, allowing us to just drop into the body and breathe. Um, then we can start to practice more of a mindful breath, signaling that parasympathetic nervous system, but use your environment, use things in your environment, the support that you're lacking, put it back inside of you, find it. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, move what you're already experiencing, meet it head on, (laughs) I just not head on, move it, meet it, meet it body No, I get it. No, you're speaking my language. Support, you know, you're speaking my language, baby. In front of you. It's not yep. a bracing. I don't want people to think that they're no. like holding, right? I'm not yeah. asking you to brace yourself. I'm asking you yeah. to push, feel yeah. the feedback, push away or into that anxiety. Those are two really, I, for a lot of people, big game changers. Because if you're freezing, you're not doing any of those things. No, right? you're, you're Running, stuck. You're not yeah. stable enough to do either yeah. one of those things. Um, yeah, you're one stuck. One of my so, yeah. mentors, favorite uh coaches, somatic practitioners, dance movement therapists, actually, uh, Kay H- Kathleen Hendricks. Um, she and her husband, Gay Hendricks, run the Hendricks Institute. Oh, okay. She talks about these fear The big markers. leap. Yeah, the big leap, yeah. yeah the big leap yeah. year. <laughs> um, yeah. She talks about these fear melters, you know, and that we can meet very small micro movements in the body to help us melt out of fight, flight, freeze, mm. or fawn. So right. if we are um, frozen, you know, that we can actually wiggle, right? We can root ourselves if we're ready to flee, you know, just feel that grounded position in our feet. 
it's yeah, I love all of her stuff, but not many people know she's a dance therapist. So yay. Right. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you don't have to, to understand her brilliance, but, uh, yeah. So there are lots of little tangible ways to actually meet our anxieties and our fears instead of running or freezing in their presence. Awesome. So where can people find you, Erica? Um, I love to hang out on Instagram at the therapist okay. who moves you, okay. um, or my website, ericahornthal.com. You know, please email me. My phone number is listed. I love to, I love to get messages from people. Cause for me, it's, it's all about that relationship. It's all about the connection. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it really is like doing this work, just making that connection because I think so much of, you know, so many of us sort of therapists didn't get this when we were younger. So we're happy to provide it because when you provide it to someone else, you're actually providing it to yourself too. So I share that as well. So Right. So I'm thanks, like, Erica. You know, what's the? Yeah. I I don't just I don't just talk about this. I do this, right? Like yes, I'm a, I walk the I'm walk. Also yeah, a customer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, not all. Right. Yeah. I try to practice and what I, you preach, and I catch myself in it all the time. I'm like, you're not doing what you tell your clients to do right now. Maybe you should try that. <laughs> yeah, but we get locked in our unconscious things we too, do. right? We so do. it's just being aware, just getting out of it earlier well, we and earlier. Should. I think that's the trick. I think that's the trick. So yeah. your book, Body Aware, is amazing. I love it. I actually mentioned yeah. it, like I said, in my book. And uh, and yeah, it's been great. It's been great. I mean, I could talk to you forever. So we'll basically cut yeah, it off here thanks. around the hour this mark. Been and wonderful. yeah, I'm so glad. Yeah, and we'll talk again soon. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Bye for now, Erica. Bye.